Okay, and we are live. Welcome, guys. Happy Hump Day. Happy Wednesday. Welcome to Behind the Shot, the show where top visual storytellers share their three best shots and the awesome stories behind them. And, uh, and it's going to be an amazing show tonight. And uh, BTS, or Behind the Shot, is brought to you by, by Deity. Just a minute, sorry. Okay, there you go. We had feedback there. Okay, so welcome again to Behind the Shot, the show where top visual storytellers share their th best three photos and the stories behind them. So this sh show is brought to you by Deity Microphones. Now, I just woke up today and realized that we are on our fifth episode. And, um, well, it just seems like it was yesterday that I impulsively released my first episode or recorded it live. And then just like it feels like it was just an hour ago where I was struggling with episode three with technical difficulties and episode four was the breeze and now we are here in episode five. And among other things, I also realized that I don't have a catchphrase for this show. As is the culture with YouTube, having a welcoming catchphrase is a good thing. And I don't have one. So the past weekend, I've been thinking about it even through Steve's episode last Monday. So, you know what? I, I thought about it and I decided that I'm going to throw it back to you guys. I'm going to make it about the people. Uh, I'm going to offer it to you and let the, the people speak. So, every episode, I will post this caption. So, all you have to do is fill it in. So, welcome to Behind the Shot, the show where blank. So, give me your funniest, funniest quote. Um, fill in with your best caption. And if I like it, I will use it in the next episode. And then the best one out of everything from that month, I probably could have Deity give us uh, a prize that I could hand over to you. So if I was to start this again with something, I would probably say, welcome to Behind the Shot, the show where anything goes and the points don't matter. So if you know that reference, then you're awesome. So let's keep it kid-friendly, safe for work. And if you guys have any ideas, put it in the comments. And I will log them and I will post them for the next episode if I like it. All right. So we have that. Now, uh, I'm very excited for our guest today. And uh, one thing is that what he does is almost exactly, actually, no, it's exactly what I do. Now, for you guys who don't know me or are not aware of who the host is, I am Noel Guevara. I'm a conservation adventure and wildlife photographer. My work can be found on Noel Guevara Photo on my Instagram right down there below. This Behind the Shot is a show that I have on YouTube. And uh, it's a part of a host of other shows that I use to insert nuggets of conservation information. So if you like what you're seeing, please like this video, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. And I'm broadcasting right now on YouTube and Facebook, but the main platform is always YouTube. Now... Our guest for today, he is a Thai conservation photographer specializing in marine conservation issues. So originally, he was a field biologist, and then he shifted his career path towards photojournalism in 2015. Currently, he is a freelance photographer for Nat Geo magazine, Thai Edition. So this guy is doing what everyone else wants to do, which is to become a photographer for Nat Geo. He has worked with... IUC in Asia, Save Our Seas Foundation, Wild Aid, and has been published in Washington Post, The Guardian, and BBC Earth. He is an Emerging League Photographer member of the International League of Conservation Photographers, a league that I have yet to apply to and hopefully get admitted to. And he is a recipient of the Early Career Explorer Grant from National Geographic Society, making him effectively a National Geographic photo uh, Explorer. So hailing from Bangkok, Thailand is Shin Arunugstishai. Did I pronounce that right, Shin? Uh, no, it's Arunugstishai, but hardly anybody pronounced it right. Really? Okay, so it must be faster in the pronunciation. Right. Okay. Yeah, it is. <laughs> All right. So how are you doing, Shin? I uh, before this, I believe you were in a shoot again. So are you, what project are you covering right now? Uh, for right now, I'm covering COVID situation in Bangkok. For the National Emergency Grant, nice. but I am also in another grant covering the seas of Myanmar. Wow. Uh, okay. So you're really 
knee deep into all that Nat Geo work right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So Shin, I watched your video. Uh, I think it was a National Geographic 2020 Storytellers Convention, and then you said there that you got started with conservation and your interest in marine life when you asked your parents to buy you a dead shark. Oh yeah, <laughs> I I think I think I got three species: uh, spot tail shark, uh, scallop hammerhead shark, and a tiger shark in the freezer. Yeah. Okay, okay, and mm. then well, how old were you then? I would say maybe five. Five years or, old. Yeah, five or six. And Man, those sharks are super cool. <laughs> and what did you do with the sharks? Uh, I keep in the freezer and just look at them. Really? But, okay. Did you yeah, yeah, yeah. did you open it's, them up or? Uh no no I just say like, just look at that thing is so <laughs> but the awesome you just like look at the hammerhead shark it's like uh, yeah but that just also show like how much they were abundant in the past. In the okay. past, like you, you can see them like 20, 30 of them in the supermarket. And nowadays, you won't see them here. Oh, wow. Okay. Mm. And then how, how did your parents react to you asking them to buy you a dead shark? Uh, I don't know. I think they just like kind of get used to it because I collect dead fish from the beach, keep them into <laughs> like salt, salt water jar. And I didn't put, in, put, didn't put in enough salt. So the fish got and it, that's about it smelly. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that's where it all began. And then you took up, uh, is it correct, marine biology in college? Is that what you had? And you had a Bachelor of Science? Yeah. I, actually, I was, I was studying biomedical first, but mm. then I get, get into diving and I'm like, you know, just like, hmm, I, I love this. I just want to spend my life working in the field right. in the sea. So yeah, change with environmental science and then later doing master later in marine biology. Okay, so, but from the onset, let me ask you this. You were already a photographer. You already knew how to take photos. It was more of a technical thing for you. Well, I, I just like shooting for fun at first, you know, when I was working on another island, working on coral reef. Okay. Like documenting what species that we will found for our program. Okay. But, but like when I was doing my master and I'm starting to get serious about photography. And yeah, that's where like... Uh, that's when like, I really, I would say, work proportionally and got into this career. Okay. Okay. Mm. So let's, let's, uh, let's uh, look at this first set of photos. So here in uh, behind the shot, we look at three shots. Could be photo, could be video. And this is the first shot that uh, Shin has for us. Can you set this shot up for us, please? Yeah, it's a photo of coral stack one coral to be precise mm -hmm. when the tide went low during spring tide and aligned with the milky way on the sky okay where did you take this shot it's a small island in the southern thailand called kobulon okay it's super lovely island and that that island has like the best uh in the tidal reef that i ever seen in thailand because like probably we don't have that much but this kind of place left here Okay, can you let's go through the technicals first. Now, what camera were you using? What were your settings? How did you approach the shot? Ah, this one I uh, use a D850. D850. Oh, I love that camera. Oh, this is amazing camera. I still right. Like. Yeah, and yeah, go Nikon. Okay, and then uh, I use the A815. Okay. Fish eye. Yeah. Fish eye. On a tripod. I don't remember the brand though. Okay, but the 15 was a Sigma. Uh, it, it, it's like A215. Ah, uh, A215, so it, it, yes. We have the same one. Yeah, the Nikon one. Yeah, yeah I borrowed someone else because like, I have a, <laughs> I have a 60 fish eye. And okay. I'm broke. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Okay, so, um, so you took this shot. Was this for a, an assignment or was this just a... You know, uh, yes, this was supposed to be for my stories on the Maori protected area of Thailand because like, this, this uh, coral field is in a national park. Okay, okay. Um, national park, okay. Yeah, it's Mari National Park here because like, at that time we have a uh, lot of change, lot, lots of uh, readjustment of our regulations. So I'm right. um, doing this story for National Thai to support on those stories and that, that narrative to help pushing the issue there. Okay, so let me, let me queue up the next one. Uh, this is... This is the beach! The beach! Yay! Oh, okay, so this is... You mean the beach 
Leonardo DiCaprio the beach. Yep, that's the one. Where he went up against a shark underwater in the storm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That that scene is like quite memorable. Okay, ties things together. Okay, so what 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 is it about this photo that you actually want to show it to us? Uh so here is also another Marine National Park. Okay. Uh, Marine National Park with let's say I think like we have like close to fifty boats in this in this photo. Okay. And yeah, the amount of the tourists and that, that's like it's it's like kind of like the worst place that the worst situation. Yeah, that's the one where he could be facing. I think. Okay. It's like you see that tiny strip of beach. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> on, on, on that strip of beach, like there there was about up to fifty. Uh, 5,000 tourists each day. Wow. Okay. I think that links to this next photo. Yep. Boom. Yeah. Wow. That's so, a lot of people. So these people are crowding that beach, the same one that most probably Leonardo DiCaprio popularized. Yep. If, if, if you see it on the beach, you, would, you wouldn't you would see it in reality back then. Right. But like, yeah. I, I would say it, the experience wasn't enjoyable at all. I just like couldn't wait to get off that, that beach myself while I was doing this, this shoot. Okay. And what about, you were, t- you were telling me before the show that the beach beforehand, before that, was yep. actually pristine. Yep. Uh, it was much longer, but like, all the, like, let's say my senior photographer, they told me that in the past, this beach, the coral there used to cover like all the shallow water areas. Wow. The same as my first photo. Okay. And yeah, then... so that's like what how uh, a t- coral reef in Thailand is supposed to be, but we hardly have it anymore. Okay. And then you have the shot. This is a really nice shot yeah. as well of sea fans. Yeah, this one is a quite an interesting place. So I end up by that feel of coral and the starlight when I was doing another story, which is this one. Mm-hmm. It's because like, uh, I was working on a development project in the southern part of Thailand where they were going to build a deep water port. Okay. And deep they, water port. Okay. Yeah. So, so they plan to use like, the site, uh, this site to be as uh, the place where they dump the sediment. Oh my gosh. Okay. Yeah. And, and this place is super special. I, I have never seen any place with like where most of the salt coral and sea fan mm-hmm. uh, are white. Not from the coral bleaching, but because of the uh, selection. Because over, over there, like, the water is so murky, and, and so they just like, feed, friendly feed on like, all, the, all the sediment out there. Okay. So it, it, it's just a selection. It's a like, very special place. The right. rock is named, it's like white rock, yeah, because like, obviously it's white. Yeah, okay. Very smart name. <laughs> we, have a, we have a question right now from, uh, no, sorry, we have uh, a, an answer from uh, a comment from John Farrell who's saying that it's pristine again now. Is he. There's a bit of a delay with uh, with our feed and our broadcast, but I think he's referring to that beach again. Ah, uh, yeah. I, I, no, no, no. I would say now they are closed, so they only allow like only researcher okay. and con- volunteer to get in there. I wouldn't say it's pristine yet. It's much nicer right now, and there lots of black tip sharks went back into that bay. Oh, nice. Okay, okay. You know that like, many sharks are philopatric, so they return to, to where they were born and just like, keep returning there to like, give birth, you know? Right, right. And actually, I, I, I got sent to photograph in the, the, the recovery effort in the bay too. And I saw a shark giving birth. Oh, nice. Hey, but I couldn't shoot it. It's so <laughs> difficult, man. It's right, so I'm difficult. Sure. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure. Okay, and then you mm-hmm. have this nice macro shot. Yeah, so, so that's what I want to say. Like, yeah, when I don't really get to shoot much like natural history, mostly I focus on like how the interaction between human and nature going on at sea. But for some natural history, I think like what key thing that we need to consider is like the timing and the information that we have. Okay. So right. here, that's true. That's true. like for that photo of the coral starlight. It mm-hmm. or I have uh, three days to shoot, and only three days. I, I, I would say in a year that like everything are aligned lot, sure, like that. Yeah. So that's required lots of planning, yes. planning, so scheduling I, and everything. Yeah, I planned that for a year, but like for this one, it's a corresponding. So that requires like, information that my my friend was doing research for. So yeah. he started 
he working on that island for seven years to like have like very precise like prediction prediction of the corresponding that he got me in there to shoot. So yeah, working with scientists really help a lot. Yeah, and it's a very hard shot to 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 nab. So you really have to be, you know, you have to know the scheduling. You know how you know have to know everything. So you know, just like that astrophotography that thing that you shot. Yeah, that was that that's impeccable timing. Yeah. Um, Okay, so John Farrell was uh, commenting that he was referring to uh, the tourists or lack thereof. Okay, so oh yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. It, it's nice. So let's say if, if you, uh, yeah, when I went there without any tourists, the, the sand just like are so fluffy. Yeah, it's like, just, like, it's just like walking on a cloud. Like, <laughs> I don't, I never walk on a cloud myself, but it's so fluffy. Let's it's recovering. Like, it's recovering. Yeah, it, it's really nice. Okay. And, yeah, so here's like some attempt before I reached the like with the Milky Way. Right. So I went there during the super moon because like I I was I was thinking like it's supposed to have like the most dramatic effect between the how the tide the spring tide recedes. Yeah. Well, yeah, but when I shot it, not as good as the Milky Way. So I went back there again, trying to find some nice angle and. Yeah, the level of the tide wasn't as like extreme as that one. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I, I and this one is like I'm not happy with it. Let's say that. <laughs> yeah. So so yeah. So, so I went back there like five five trips and spent a lot of my budget on that. Yeah. And yeah. To get all of it going. Yeah. I I, mean, I get you. I I know how hard it is to. Do nab shots like these, and you have to have. It's not. It's not just the settings, you know. It's not just the skill set. Everything has to come together, and yeah, and I can see that here. So, did this uh this original photo? Did this win any awards? Did you enter it to any competition? Ah, uh, I did, but uh, I didn't win anything. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's normal. But yeah, if I mainly it's like for my story for the Thailand MPA. Yeah, and that usually happens. You get the stunning shot, everything works together, and but it's not awards worthy. But in itself, mm. you know, it is quite an accomplishment. And thank you for sharing that with us. So, and then this, when did you shoot this? It was in in March and during the dark moon. In March of which yeah. year? Uh, two thousand eighteen, and it was black moon. Yeah, to okay. have like less like light. And be a light. Yeah. Okay, with the with the D eight fifty. Yep. Okay, so for those of you who are joining us, we are now on our second photo. This is behind the shot. This is the show where <laughs> I was gonna say again that anything happens and the scores don't. Uh, the you know the scores doesn't matter. But no, this is behind the shot where top visual storytellers share their best three shots and the stories behind them. And this is brought to you by Deity Microphones. And if you want to follow Shin and his work, follow him on Instagram, Shinalodon. Is this uh, a reference to Megalodon, Shin? I would Obviously. assume. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. I got that. I got that. Okay. And then right. if you want to see my work, you can also visit Noel Guevara Photo on um, Instagram. Okay. Now... This is actually, the next one, is actually a photo that uh, I would say that I've been hoping that you would bring up in this show. And it is a very adorable story, right? The first half is a very, very adorable story. But the next half, it became quite tragic. Now, without saying any, giving out any spoilers, you know, you know how we hate that. Mm. I will let you uh, bring us through it. And... I mean, I mean, this shot in its own, right, is a, it's a very wonderful, adorable shot, and it speaks volumes. So, Shin, tell us what the story is behind this shot before we move on to the next photos. Right. Uh, this photo is a photo of like, an orphan dugong that was rescued from stranding, and it got lost from its, from its mother. Okay. And, yeah, dugong at a like, very young age didn't need to get uh, what need to stay with its mother for like up, up to two years. Up to two years, okay. So up it to has to years. stay. So it has to stay with its mom for two years. And how old do you think this dugong is? Uh, I think the estimated by the marine biologist here was about three months. Three months. Yeah. Wow. Okay. But it, it's quite shabby, eh? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I mean, yeah. twenty-one months to go. Uh, okay. So dugong orphaned, stranded, 
do you do you have an idea on how it got orphaned, or was there any news report on that? That one, uh, I totally got no idea how it got stranded. But okay. Yeah, we tried to locate its, its mom, but couldn't. Okay, so again, Dukong got yeah. stranded, and then it was rescued by an NGO? Uh, it, it, by the official here, uh, the Department of Marine and Coastal Resource. Okay. They are doing amazing job here. Okay, mm. and then I read that when they rescued uh, this Dugong, they were feeding it like 15 times a day. Uh, yeah, it, that's, it did eat a lot, eh? <laughs> yeah, no it's wonder. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, they did try to feed it like uh, formula milk. They decided formula milk under the the like some technical mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. advice from the team at Japan who used to care for dugong too, okay. and we, we tried to gradually shift the the food into like with some composition of seagrass right. species that it eats. Right. So teach them how to eat seagrass or something like that. Okay, mm. okay. And then you have this next shot. And... Ah, yeah, this little, okay, this shoppy thing, just like, it, it just doesn't have its mom. Okay. So we speculated that this, like, orange kaya is something that it looks as its mom. So it just, like, keeps uh, nuzzling, just, like, going around this, like, orange kayak oh, all day. Oh, okay, okay. It was snuggling the kayak, thinking it was his mom. Was, yeah. this, was this where you were feeding it from? From the kayak? Uh, yeah, I know the kayak was used to go out into the bay, mm-hmm. and when it just like know that the kayak was there, it just like follow after the kayak and <laughs> just like so cute. Not, under it all day. Okay, yeah. okay. That's, like, that, that's how the baby dugong like uh, stay with its mom in the wild. It just like not to its mom. Right, right. And then you have here they are trying to feed the dugong the formula. Yeah, I yeah. Veterinarian and local volunteer. Uh, this dugong like. Uh, Events bring so many people to work together on this because it's, I would say, it's something special. On, on the first day that I heard about this, I was like busy on some other thing, but I, I, I just planned that like once I finish like my task, I just need to photograph this thing. It's just right. like this, this story is like has so much potential, and I think like it's very important for people to care. It is, it is, mm. and and I believe uh, this became a national sensation as well. Uh, because I think they were circulating the, this photo. I, I saw it on a on an online article where one of the one of the volunteers was hugging the the dugong. They yeah. called him. They called her her right. It was a female. It was her. Okay. Yeah. Called him Mar Mariam. Ma- Mariam. I I believe it's a let's say the name with uh, Islamic uh, influence because like the community on this island uh, mostly they are Muslim. Okay. I see. I see. Mm. So can you describe the the uh yes uh this man uh this volunteer he's the uh, he's the one from the volunteer group called the dugong guard who okay patrol the area just like for illegal fisher or poacher that may hurt these animals right. and when Mary was there so he has been taking care of her since she arrived at this place and yeah she has a like, very strong attachment to him right uh, uh, after Mariam feed she gonna sleep. Okay. So so she just like swam to like some some like volunteer or the the veterinarian that uh, she got close to, but she tends to prefer that man. Right, right. And just like and just like let him hop and just like <laughs> sleep on him. And he falls asleep in his arms. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm. And, and this is uh yeah we have comments here uh, from Bea saying that it's a very cute baby dugong and that is my first reaction to it as well. It's so so what adorable. Here? And here, I think, is it playing and the in the yes. The silt? Uh, we have some concern about uh, uh, about like how if it's taking care of it for so long, it's gonna have a like, much reliance on a human or not. Right. So our plan is like to try to like do hand off, just let it like do the doing the rehabilitation in the wild instead of like doing it in, in captive. Right. right. Of course. And I think it shows lots of success. Uh, Mariam spent much more time, gradually spent more time on her own, mm-hmm. going around the bay by herself, like playing, learning, exploring the environment, just like playing on his, in the seagrass, like eating by her on her own. And this okay. one, I, I got this shot and I saw her playing, just like, just rolling around on the bottom. <laughs> That's, <laughs> That's so cute. cute. 
<laughs> yeah. That's so cute. And then he it became a big national sensation. So um here what what is happening in this photo? This one is a it's it's her funeral. We have a big funeral ceremony for her. That's quite Oh weird. my gosh, I think I telegraphed the, what happened to her. So Okay, so what, what happened to her in the end? So this is a funeral. I am so sorry that I put this photo up front. Um, so what happened to, to, to Mariam? Yep, uh, she, she died. And at, at, at that time, we didn't really know what happened to her until the veterinarian did a necropsy, cut her open, and saw like, some plastic inside her uh, yeah, GI tract. Plastic? That so that's what eventually killed her. How long yeah. was she was she in the in the care of the, the volunteers? Uh she was under our care for like, let's say for four months. Let's say their care because like I finished shooting and I, I left. But yeah, the, the team was there like work on her for four uh, four months, I think. Oh my goodness. So what happened? She just you know, she just uh her condition worsened or was it immediate? Nah, it, it's it's gradual. So she stopped she it started like when she seems to be stressed and then indigestion, then she doesn't eat and becoming I don't know the word in English, but yeah, less active, less active. Okay, okay. Right. Weaker, well. right? it's becoming weaker. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. And then so so she died, and was there a big uh, impact in terms of uh, you know, she had the following already. Yes, uh, yeah, I think it, she was named like National Sweetheart. P- they even have like CCTV, oh of, many CCTV of that way for people to just say like, log in and see how the volunteer, the veterinarian work on her. And yeah, it's quite a big sensation here. And so when she died, I could barely believe it myself. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, but, yeah and I mean, but, looking at her here, I mean, uh, yeah, this is a really yeah. nice photo. You could almost assume that she was smiling. Yeah, uh, the, 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 the impact here is we have a major like revision of by the Ministry of Environment to push on the issue about plastic pollution. Right, of course. Yeah, especially the single-use one. And uh, I would say it was according to the survey earlier this year, I think, regarding the the awareness regarding plastic pollution, I think, like, we ran the first one. Yeah. Which is, like, okay, that's a good thing. And it also affects the policy change, how that's true. they uh, most major co- uh, department store and convenience store, they stop giving out, like, those single-use plastic as, like, before, before, like, anything. I just, like, want to buy, buy, like, bubble gum. They just give me a plastic bag for that. And it's, like... Let's say it's quite a BS, but now, like, yeah, so we start acting, right. thinking more about it, and it works. But let's say for now, as we are depending on more of the delivery stuff during the yes. COVID. And of yes. course, the, the medical stuff that we're currently using yeah. as well, you know, for everything. And then, you know, uh, Shin, I was looking around uh, after Mariam, I read all the articles, and I saw this. Oh, yep. So that's so many fan art. Yeah, that's a really really nice artwork. Uh, this was I'm sure this was after Mariam yeah. passed away. I thought she passed away. Yeah, but I would say that the tale is wrong though. It's a Malachi tale. This one, <laughs> but it you know it's yeah it, 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 it's lovely. Yeah, it's yeah. lovely. That's so many fan art. Yeah, <laughs> it has captured the hearts of many. So mm. uh, I think that is good proof. And yeah, it's a. Uh, Wow, it was an adorable story that really turned for the worst, huh? And Aye. and uh, yeah, it, it was. I, I, I would say she would, she didn't die in vain, though. Yeah, we had an impact here. Um, really? Okay, that's yeah. at least that's good. Mm-hmm. That's good. And uh, people are very aware about what single-use plastic does to our marine life, from ghost yep. nets to that fork and that straw in the in the turtle's nostril. So it has. That one. That one day, I when I went to. Uh, convenience store or something I, I that's a mother told her like daughter young daughter yeah see but don't don't get that did you remember Miriam? Uh, uh, that's like very beautiful yeah, yeah yeah okay so it has penetrated that fabric of uh, the community that's good mm. so she's becoming an example i just wish that she was able to survive though i mean yeah. considering everything 
Yeah. Okay, so that was our second photo. For those of you who are joining us right now, this is behind the shot. This is where our top visual storytellers, just like Shin, share their best three photos and this amazing stories behind them. And this was a very, very touching, adorable story that turned for the worst. And it was quite tragic in the end. Uh, personally, I was really affected by the photos that Shin took and the story that went along with it. I was only aware of the stranding at first and how they were caring for it. And it was only when Shin and I got talking again for this particular show just a, you know, a, a day ago or two, two days ago that I realized that she passed away and you know that really shook me to my core. So uh, this, these stories from our marine life, what they're dealing with because of the impact of you know, our footprint, you know, our plastic footprint, it's there. It's real. And we, it's our changes to our daily habits that you know, could really have a long-term positive effect on that. So we are now moving to our third photo, uh, which is actually, Shin, very interesting because uh, I believe you took this photo. Okay, so you took this photo in the Bahamas. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, but that, that wasn't really yet the shot that I want, want to show too much. I, I love this shot, but yeah, the one that I want to show is the shine in pieces. The shark in pieces. Okay. All right. So this was shot in the Bahamas. Uh, let me yeah. cue up that other shot that the shark in pieces. You, it's interesting though. The, actually, the reason I brought this up is because this was from a grant from the Save Our Seas Foundation. Is that? Uh, yes, Save Our Seas Foundation. Is yeah, that yeah. correct? Okay. So I actually also apply, applied for that grant at the same time you did. But I was still just, you know, I think that was my first year uh doing photography conservation photography i knew i had no chance of, of winning but after seeing your work from that i mean that was really really impressive so here is the shot that you were what you were referring to yeah. so this shark in pieces so you also work on shark conservation yeah i used to study sharks before and when i this photo was taken when i was doing my master mm -hmm. for my research and this photo really According to the CRC's grant, this photo got me that grant. Okay. And oh, this, this photo, photo got me to work, start working for Nancy Ah, oh, Wow, nice. That's yeah, impressive. So, yeah, that, without this photo, I wouldn't really, I, I don't think I would really get like, that much opportunity. Okay, so where did you shoot this? How did you shoot it? Were all the pieces together or? Uh, let's say I was working on another, the research on life history of shelves. So, I was doing a growth study, which mm -hmm. required us to cut the sh cut shaft, uh, dissect their shaft, and get some part of the vertebrae right. to estimate their, their age parameter and compare with like, the growth to do a plot, let's say a growth curve. Right. Yeah, and that's it's, uh, essential information for like doing the population assessment in the long run. Okay. So yes, I cut, I, I, I extract the vertebrae. And then for the remaining part, uh, I give them to the people in the market because mm -hmm. like protein, right? I don't want to eat them. Of course. Yeah. And they cut them into pieces like this. And I just say, okay. Uh, the way I position the shots here is, is uh, like when you're taking photo, uh, photographic uh, document of specimen for science, right. please just put the shot on the left side like this. And I just like, it's just, it just like, they just saying like, ghosts tell me in right. Thai. Okay. Yeah, it just, okay. it just like pop in my head. I okay. have this photo in my head. Just like okay. shoot it. Mm. And uh, what kind, what species is this? This one is a uh, spot tail shark. Okay. Okay. And then uh, you have other photos here uh, in the series. Yeah. So, yep. I went to shark fin factory later. Like, yeah, it's like where they push all the shafts and separate them into pieces and yeah, distribute them around. And when we talk about shaft conservation, we, we all, for most of us, like we're just gonna talk about like the shaft finning thing. Okay, it's a big issue, let's say 73% according to the study by Worm, right? In okay. 2003. Okay. But uh, I think like when we talk about Southeast Asia, I think the situation of target fishery for shafts is not that common, okay. maybe like you know in Indonesia, but for in many countries, let's say for Thailand, for Myanmar, where I extensively work there, we have the issue is actually more into 
or fishing and non non by non selective fisheries. I okay. Think can, yeah. Okay. And you have these dried shark uh, fins. Oh well. yeah, it, it dried shark, of course. It dried dry fins, yeah. So it's just showing, but this one I take it because I, I was bored during the COVID thing here. Things are quiet down, so I went to the Shanghai town. So and just like shark. Started. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So how is it uh, for you taking photos of sharks, uh, you know, uh, fished out in this way? You know, going back to your your passions when you were a kid, when you asked your mom to buy you dead sharks, is it, uh, were you desensitized to this? I, I'm sure it's very difficult covering something like this. Well, yeah, man, but like the first 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 time i went to fish market like uh, before i did my master mm -hmm. when i just like start like to learning about like doing so much so way i i gotta say i cried i didn't wow, expect okay. me to cry because like on that time i saw like about 200 hammerheads wow. laying everywhere big eye treasure sharks like seven of them and then we have some pelagic treasure there too oh wow Yep, and yeah, hundreds. Ah, in, in total, I think I saw a thousand sharks on that day. On that, that one day. Okay. Yeah. So uh, for our guests, so shark, uh, sharks are actually, how do you say this? There is this big stigma and misconception that sharks um, are mindless killers. And what uh, people do not know is actually we are harvesting sharks or fishing them out much faster than they can reproduce. Uh, Shin, if, hmm. correct me if I'm wrong, I know they're, it's between 75 to, I think, 150 million sharks a year that they're fishing out of the ocean. Is that correct? Uh, the estimate uh, range from about uh, up to 271 Ooh, wow. million, but, but that's like the maximum estimate. And that was from a uh, paper from 2000. 13, I think. Right, right. Yeah, by Boris Worm. But I, I would say, like, after uh, the two, 2000s, like, the, the cash landing of sharks tend to keep declining, of course, over fishing. Of course, yes, correct. Yeah. So it's not more of, like, uh, how may, uh, people are starting not to, to take sharks off from the sea, but more of they're running out of sharks. That's why the, uh, that, the catch that's is quite, long, getting smaller. That, that, that's quite depend, but actually, let's say particular in, in our area, Southeast Asia, the fishing effort are still there. Right. We don't have a sh that major change in fishing regulation. That's true. Okay. We still use non-selective fisheries. Okay. So, so where are they? <laughs> that's true. Okay. So that's why people are saying uh, 150 or 200 million sharks that we kill every year compared to like probably less than 20 humans that are, you know, the fatalities from shark encounters. Mm. So that poses that rhetorical question, which one really is the monster? So <laughs> is yeah, it us so or the shark? I, I want to show you this photo too. Uh, and this one is, uh, they are all bull shark and they are all bull shark baby. And they oh, wow. they just been born for less than a month because like when you see all of them, they have like umbilical scar, like, yeah, like you baby. Yeah, they have, they have scar actually here in a month. So they, they just been born and they just all got wiped out. Oh, wow. Okay. And uh, so we have uh, just a minute, uh, Shin. So for okay. those of you guys who are watching right now, please feel free to post your questions and ask. Um, we are now on the third uh, video. I chose not to end the stream on Facebook simply because I think this is a very, very important topic. That's really close to my heart, which is shark conservation. But I'd like to take a minute to um, to invite everyone. Uh, there is a link for YouTube there, and I'm paying more attention to the comments on YouTube. So, if you want to continue the stream to be more wanting to be more interactive, please do join us on on YouTube. The link is right there uh, in the description that I posted. So we will see you in YouTube. So, is this uh, a nursery? This photo. Yeah, it's uh, Channel 3. So I, I would say like, um, for especially for the coastal sharks, there are like some species like the black tip reef shark that right. they are like tend to be inhabit like near shore habitat. Okay. And these kind of like mangrove area or shallow lagoon, they are very important for their life cycle, especially right. when you consider that like they are tend to be returning to place where they were born. Right. So yeah, Just of like course. Sea they, yeah. Not, so it's not only like uh, 
uh, overfishing. We also yeah. need to look at to like habitat degradation for like the coastal shark species too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and whoo we can move. I think. <laughs> okay, and what is this shot? Should yeah, I would say especially in Southeast Asia region, we have very limited research on sharks and also other elasmobranch. Yeah, here is the way when you try to find the age of the shark. So we extract the vertebrae, yeah. slice them up into like a uh, scientific slide and just look counting the vertebrae ring. That, that, that was a uh, very, that is like classic method, how we study the age of the shark. But it, it turns out that like now we are mostly, it, it, is, it is slightly that we're going to underestimate the actual age of the shark right. by that technique. It tends to be older than that. Yep, and that was a like, new, uh, like working on the, I would say, sharks are being discovered, new species are being discovered every year. Okay, okay. Yeah. And, so this, and, this particular uh, shot, uh, you took this in the Bahamas, is that, is that correct? Uh, this one from the Florida in the Gulf Stream. Gulf Stream, uh, okay. Um, yep, so yeah, it's a silky shark and got yeah, the hook by, this one seems to be by rec recreational fisher. Okay, but mm. was it uh was there an injury? Um, and is this because uh one of our guests last week, Bo, he showed a video of the same uh, uh limbatus shark, a uh, mm. uh, uh, black tip, and mm. it had like they called it smiley because of the hook damaged ah the jaw. Okay. So I wanted to ask if this one uh is his, is the jaw damaged as well? This one no, nah, this one seems seems fine, but yeah. I just hope that like the hook gonna be rust off and gone very soon. Hopefully, yeah, yeah. Mm. So actually, that, yeah, there's yeah. many interesting study about like how some hook got into the shark and got like expelled throughout the the other body part. Mm, okay, okay. Yeah. So there is, there there is that hope. I have seen this a particular photo, this tail photo shin i saw it in the, i think a, a report of save our seas if i'm not mistaken yes. yeah it's yeah. magazine Jemacy magazine yeah i i love the photo my, myself don't get me wrong but i just like want to end it leave it there at like the economic value of shark let's say for the bahamas which is the shark sanctuary right yeah the it's not everywhere it's not the same the bahamas has very well established shark diving tourism which like generate more than 100 million us dollar per year okay Okay. Yeah, but even for Thailand, like we are big on fisheries, we don't have that much sharks for you to see. But even though after we did the, a study on the economic value of sharks with tourism, it's still worth more than sharks in fish market, about two times. Okay, okay. Yeah, so that's a key incentive that I think should be helpful to drive the policies in, in the end. But mm. at the same time, you you have to wonder right now because of the lockdowns and the pandemic, uh, the, oh, those yeah. those tourist tourist dollars are not entering, nope, in the Bahamas right now. So, are you you have any idea how they're doing? Uh, I, I just talked to a friend in Bimini, uh, yeah, and it's in lockdown too. So, but for let's say for tourism industry, like. The way how things are locked down or tourists is also affect the ecotourism industry where the money doesn't go reach to reach the actual conservation work and that's happened around the world including the galapagos and things right. so i think that's also happening here yeah because so, uh, i read it also in tanzania in south africa and, and they're oh, yeah. having problems as well because there are no tourist dollars to pay for uh the rangers who are protecting against poaching and everything to fund all yeah. of that so uh, yeah, it it is a uh, I'm sure I'm, I'm sure it's a trying time right now, and mm. so what other projects are you working on now aside from COVID? Do you have one? I mean, uh, that's marine conservation related. Uh, I still like, on need to hold off my Myanmar story for now. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Of course, I just couldn't go there. <laughs> so yeah, I'm stuck here for a while. I don't know when we are gonna be out from the lockdown, but. Yeah, I hope to at least just like go to the sea at least. Yeah, I at also least, miss the sea as well. At least Thailand, it's fine. Just miss the smell. <laughs> just like give give me a like a salt spray, a smell the sea candle or whatever. Just like right. happy just to get that, that just to get yeah. that taste. Okay, all right. So Shin, uh, we have finished the the third photo. Cool, cool. And uh, really amazing shots. Uh, and uh, you have been a photojournalist for how long? 
uh, I tweet professionally, I would say from my first SEO, 2016. 2016. So it, yeah. yeah. Okay, in just four short years, you were able to, to generate uh, such a big body of work. So uh, for those who are watching who are photographers who are trying to go into conservation, do you have any specific tips for them, whether it's technical or on how the best to approach uh, being a conservation photographer? I think one... I, I'm copying this from my mentor. He, okay. Yeah, is you spend your time working on a story in your backyard. It's very a very good like tip that he gave me. And, okay. And just like reach out to the people, the scientists, and read a lot, read scientific paper, read report, and collaborate with conservation related group, NGO, or community group, or researcher. I think. When you talk to them and ask them what story that they want the public to know, what is important, how should we contribute to the actual conservation purpose, I think talk to them about these. And I think you're going to get like lots of nice material right. it's, like, about, about the story. Mm. Right. And I'm sure everyone wants to get this particular shot as well. I mean... No, <laughs> that's the, yeah, oh. I'm sure uh, people want to take photos of sharks, but it is a, it is a long road, I'm sure. But for you, you were able to do it in, in a span of, uh, what, four years, Shin? That's, yeah, that's, four. that's, uh, that's very impressive. Yeah, lucky. I got a nice story to work on. So <laughs> yeah, it's been, let's say like one story, I spent a year keep shooting the hell out of it. And so I got like a lot of stuff. Like, okay. Yeah. Okay, and then you um, you mentioned that you have a, a Nikon D850. Yep, and a Nikon D6. Uh, no, not, not D6, uh, C6. Z6, it's, okay, great, yeah. fantastic. It's okay. nice, so it's so nice, like my main like, top side camera. Okay, that's cool. Okay, mm. so if you guys want to see more of Shin's work, visit his Instagram, Shinalodon, and he has awesome, awesome stuff there, really great. And it's just a, it's mostly marine conservation, but this guy also does, does photojournalism. He is a freelance photographer for National Geographic Thailand, and that in itself should give you a reason to check out his Instagram. So we are at the end of our show, and uh, Shin, uh, before you say goodbye, uh, I would like to, to remind you that uh, I'll see you after, right? Yeah. So don't leave our conversation first. I will just close the show. But um, you can say goodbye to all the people who are watching on Facebook and YouTube. Go ahead. Goodbye all the people who are watching on Facebook and YouTube. <laughs> okay. As simple as that. Okay. Uh, all right. So, Shin, thank you very much for joining us. And uh, it's been awesome. Thank you for sharing all those stories and your photos. Hi. Thank you, everyone. Thank okay. you for your time. All right. All right, guys. So that was our fifth episode for the day. And again... Fifth episode, I still don't have a catchphrase. So if you guys can help me out and fill in the blank. And um, this is will this what whichever one that I will pick will be the one that I'll be using in the next episode. So welcome to Behind the Shot, the show where blank is bl or whatever. It's up to you. Get get creative. Get funny. As long as it's safe for work, I will use it in the next episode. And the best one for the month will get a prize from me. So, you know, just help a brother out so this week it's been awesome and we actually have one more guest which is on friday which is boogs rosales right and this time we are going to share videos once again so it's uh it's gonna be well i won't say it's gonna be a long a long uh episode but at the very least it's gonna be exciting we will be going up on I guess five o'clock and we will be showing videos from his expeditions. We will be showing videos from his documentaries. We will be showing videos as well from, um, he has a new show right now, which is called Rec Hunters. And uh, it's something that I think you guys need to see. It's on I want TV. So this guy has done it all. And I've worked with him so many times. So Boogs Rosales is one amazing dude. And you would want to see his work on his expeditions, the documentaries, and Wreck Hunter as well. So that is it for today. And Behind the Shot is brought to you by JT Microphones. And it is the show where we have these awesome storytellers just like Shen and Boogs. And they show their top, top three photos and videos. 
and the awesome stories behind them. And it's been a blast having these five episodes with you. Hope we get to 100, 150, 200. Well, I can only hope. But with you guys here, it's going to be possible. So thank you very much, guys. And I will see you in the next episode. Cheers.